Okay, now we're going to talk about some periodic trends. Uh, in this section, we're going to talk about size of atoms and effective nuclear charge. First, we have to decide how we're going to define atomic size. Because what's an atom, really, right? You've got the nucleus, and then you've got these electrons in these kind of standing waves. How do you measure that, right? So we have to come up with ways of measuring an atom and defining what we consider the size. So there's different ways. So we're just going to talk about them briefly, and then we're going to say, well, it doesn't really matter. Uh, one way to measure it is what's called the non-bonding atomic radius. It's also called the van der Waals radius. And this is half the distance between adjacent nuclei in the atomic solid. So here, if we have solid krypton, uh, we can measure, we can identify where the nuclei are and measure the distance between the nuclei. And so then you figure, well, these are identical atoms the radius would have to be half of the distance between the two nuclei, right? Or the diameter would be equal. Um, we can also look at a bonding atomic radius, also called a covalent radius. For nonmetals, um, we're looking at half the distance between two of the atoms that are bonded together. This distance um, is going to be different than if you had an atomic solid, because the process of this bond forming pulls them closer, but the, the bromine, um, the distance between the two bromine atoms in a molecule is 228 picometers. You divide that in half, you get a, a bromine radius of 114. In metals, you look at the um, half the distance between two of the atoms next to each other in a crystal of that metal. Well, actually measuring it, um, sometimes they use x-ray crystallography, and there's a variety of different techniques that they can use. So what we're going to talk about, we're going to say atomic radius is just kind of a, a more general term. Um, the average radius of an atom, based on measuring it in a variety of compounds and as an element as well. And so it's just sort of a general term. Because here we're going to look at some trends in sizes, and we don't really care. Um, a, we're not caring about an, a specific compound. There are situations where you would care about, well, I want the carbon radius in this compound. But we're not going to care about that. Um, the, 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 this atomic radius is always uh, going to end up being smaller than the van der Waals radius, because it includes compounds. Um, for, for bond lengths, we can approximate the length of bonds by just adding the radii of the two atoms involved in that bond. And that's what we do for covalent bonds. So there are trends in the periodic table in terms of um, atomic radius. And this, this graph kind of looks like a big old mess. What we're graphing here is atomic number on the x-axis and radius in picometers. And we see we go from hydrogen, and then helium's a little smaller, and then it jumps up to lithium, and then it comes down as we go across the period, and then here's sodium in the next period, and, and then it goes down again, and it jumps up and goes down and jumps up and goes down. Um, and so there's this pattern. If we look at just these high points here, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, those are the alkali metals. That's group one on the periodic table. And the general trend is, as you go down that column, the radius gets larger, right? If we look at the noble gases, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, it's not a line, it's not linear, but as you go down, they get larger. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Because when you look at xenon, it's got 54 electrons. Helium's got two electrons. Which one do you think would be bigger? Well, the one with 54 electrons must be bigger than the one with two electrons, right? So that makes sense. But this trend from lithium to neon, as we go across the periodic table, the atoms are getting smaller. That's counterintuitive. Lithium has three electrons. Neon has 10 electrons, 
what makes common sense is that neon would be larger, and yet it's not. It's smaller. Here's another way to look at it. Here, the height of each of these blocks represents the radius of the atom. And so we see as we go, go across, they're getting smaller. What's going on here? The quantum mechanical model helps to explain this. Well, we've got shielding. So all of these except for hydrogen are multi-electron atoms. Those core electrons shield the valence electrons from the, the charge of the nucleus. The shielding causes those outer electrons to not experience the full charge that's on the nucleus. So here's an um, illustration of that. Here we've got, this is lithium. So we've got three electrons. Here's the valence electron. This is in the second energy level. Remember, as the quantum number n increases, the size of the orbitals increase. So on average, this electron is going to be farther from the nucleus. These are the two core electrons. The core electrons essentially shield this valence electron from two of the charges here. And so this electron experiences a plus one attraction. So we can say the effective nuclear charge is the actual nuclear charge minus the shielding caused by the core electrons. So let's look at nitrogen and argon. So for nitrogen, what is the actual charge on the nucleus? For nitrogen. How many protons does nitrogen have? Seven. Seven. It's got seven protons, okay? So the actual charge on the nucleus is plus seven. How many valence electrons does nitrogen have? Five. Five. So five valence electrons, and then how many core electrons? Two. Two core electrons. The core electrons is the shielding. So we've got seven minus two. So nitrogen has an effective nuclear charge of 5. The valence electrons experience a plus 5 attraction from the nucleus because the two electrons that are in the core shield it. So what about argon? How many electrons does argon have? 18 electrons, so it's got 18 protons, right? So it's... The charge on the nucleus is 18. How many valence electrons? Eight. Eight. How many core electrons? Ten. ten. So it experiences a shielding of ten. So its effective nuclear charge is eight, which has a higher effective nuclear charge, which is bigger, eight or five. It's bigger. The electrons, the valence electrons on argon are experiencing a plus 8 charge. The valence electrons on nitrogen are experiencing a plus 5 charge. Yeah, so remember Coulomb's law, the potential energy is related to or proportional to the charges of the two things divided by the radius. So if we've got Q1 being an electron and Q2 being the nucleus, this has Q2 as 5, this has Q2 as 8. There's going to be a higher attraction. So will the effective nuclear charge always be the number of valence electrons? The effective nuclear charge will be the total number of electrons minus the core electrons. So a lot of the time it's the valence A lot of times it'll be the same as the valence electrons. So when we go down a column, we are adding electrons in higher and higher principal energy levels, right? If you look at neon and argon, neon has its valence electrons in the n equals 2 level, argon is n equals 3. And each of those levels is larger. And this is where it can be helpful to think of the um, Bohr model, right? So we have 1, 2, 3, 
four, right? And as we go to higher n, n equals one, n equals two, n equals three, n equals four, we're putting electrons in larger and larger layers. And so it makes sense that the atom is getting bigger. Moving across a period, though, what we see is that the effective nuclear charge increases while the principal energy level remains the same. Let me see if I've got a picture coming up. No, I don't. So we already looked at nitrogen. The effective nuclear charge for nitrogen was 5, right? And neon, how many protons are in the nucleus of neon? 10. So for neon, 10, and it's got 10 electrons, 8 valence electrons, and 2 core electrons. So the shielding, there's 2, and so its effective nuclear charge is 8. So we're looking at an electron in the second level here. Here's our electron. In n equals 2, it's roughly the same distance from the nucleus, but now the charge that it's experiencing is different. So R is the same, but Q2 is increasing. So we're going from 5 to 8. This higher attraction pulls these electrons in. And so we see as we go across a period that the atoms get a little bit smaller as we keep adding electrons, because we're also adding protons, and the effective nuclear charge is increasing. Does that make sense, any at all? How did you get eight? Oh, eight valence oh. so Eight valence electrons, total. two core electrons, total of ten electrons. Okay. Yeah. Which chart? The, the graph. Yes. So here's, here's sodium. Well, we were, we were looking here. Um, lithium to neon. Now, the difference down here is very small. But the trend is that it gets smaller. These are trends. These are not hard and fast rules. There are exceptions. And we see, um, especially with the transition elements, they're not very predictable, and there's, you get some of these bumps in here. But in general, as you go across, the elements are getting smaller. Because the effective nuclear charge is increasing, the electrons are pulled in tighter. In the transition metals, um, we see the column or group trend being the same as you go down a group the atoms get larger. When you go across in that D block, you kind of have all bets are off. The, the valence electrons are the same in general, and the effective nuclear charge is going to be very similar. And so you're going to see very little difference in size for those, those transition metals. So this is the sort of question that you need to be able to answer for an exam. On the basis of periodic trends, choose the larger atom in each pair if possible. So tin or iodine. Well, we have to find them on the periodic table. And I should have a periodic table on here, but I don't. So I'll draw a little piece of it. So here's tin and here's iodine. They're in the same period. What's the trend as we go this way? It gets smaller. So which one's bigger then? Two. The tin. Okay with that? Mm -hmm. let's, let's compare germanium and polonium. Hey. So here's polonium and here's germanium. So the trend going down is that it gets bigger. The trend going this way is that it gets smaller. So we've got opposing trends here, right? So if I was giving this as an open-ended question, I'd accept two answers. I would accept not possible. But let's, let's look at this graph again. 
which seems to be a, a bigger difference, going across here or going down? The going down is, is more important than the going across. So if I had to choose one, I would choose um, polonium to be larger. But we have conflicting trends, and so it's kind of iffy on that one. Well, you can look at the effective nuclear charge, and you'd find out that polonium has a higher effective nuclear charge, which would cause us to predict that it would be smaller. But polonium's valence electrons are in principal quantum number, or principal level six, and germanium, those are in level four. As we go out, the levels get larger, and so that predicts that polonium would be larger. So for this one, I would accept two answers, um, not possible to tell, or polonium. Chromium and tungsten, where'd those go? So if we look at that, chromium's here and tungsten is down there. Which one's bigger? The tungsten. Going down, they always get bigger. 